Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Edinburgh International Conference Centre. My name is Gail McGuinn, and I am Head of Association Sales here at the EICC. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight to EICC Live, our series of free public talks designed to engage, educate and inspire our community. Before we dive into tonight's session, I've just got a couple of housekeeping notes to go through. So there is no planned fire alarms for this evening. So if you hear one, please follow the signs and exit the building. Um, and additionally, please note that we are filming this evening. For those of you on social media, we encourage you to share your thoughts and experiences using the hashtag EICC Live. Let's keep the conversation going long after tonight's event. The EICC's vision is to create an environment which inspires ideas that change the world. And EICC Live is a vital part of our commitment to community engagement. We aim to bring people together to educate, aspire, just as our thousands of conference delegates experience here at the EICC throughout the year. Since its launch, EICC Live has covered a wide range of topics, from the future of healthcare and women in technology, to sports endurance, banking and neurodiversity. Each talk offers fresh perspectives and valuable insights. Tonight's session, Breaking the Silence on HPV, holds particular significance to me. In November, the ICC will host the International Papillomavirus Conference, attracting up to 1,400 leading experts in the field from across the globe. As part of this, I am thrilled to be collaborating with a fantastic group of local experts who are dedicated to leaving a lasting, meaningful impact from the conference. In addition to tonight's talk, the group will be conducting educational sessions at schools across Scotland where HPV vaccination rates are notably low. We are also organising pop-up events at universities to target international students who may not have access to the HPV vaccination in their home countries, but can receive it while they are here studying in Scotland. And to raise further awareness, we are engaging with famous Scottish landmarks with the request to illuminate in purple on the opening day of the conference. This initiative showcased the power of conferences. Not only, they not only provide opportunities for education and networking among delegates, but they bring tangible benefits and driving positive change to the residents of Edinburgh and beyond. So without further ado, let's begin tonight's proceedings, and I'm delighted to welcome Anita Jane Wiseman to the stage. Hi, thank you. I'm, my name is Anita and I work for the International Papillomavirus Society as a campaign manager. So I'm going to speak very quickly um, to introduce the campaign, which is kind of working very closely with the local organising committee to look at how we um, in increase our make those links between public awareness and local activity to get um, a, a good legacy from this conference that's coming up in November. So. Um, First question, what is HPV? It's the human papillomavirus. It's the most common virus. Almost all of us will have it at some point in our life. Um, and yet, it's the, and it causes a number of cancers, a lot of which people aren't aware of. It takes about 470,000 people's lives every year in total through all of these cancers. And almost all of those deaths can be avoided through gender neutral vaccination and cervical screening. So that's what we're here to talk about. That's what we're campaigning at the I at IPVS to raise awareness of. Um, so why do we raise awareness? Well, we think there's really a kind of there's an ethical dimension to it. If you're going to give people a vaccine, they really ought to know what it is they're getting vaccinated against. So, and what and there's also a motivational. Why would you actually go for a vaccine if you didn't know what it was for? Um, and in many places. Um, where people have to elect to actually go and get the vaccine, that's quite a significant um, barrier. So that's one reason. We also just really feel that there's a, a, a real, we need to get vaccines out there and we need awareness so that people know that, they can, that they're there, that they work and that they can actually um, save lives. And then we have these are a number of people that are involved in our campaign. This is Marcia Cross, who some of you may have, may recognise. She's a desperate housewife. She's also an H, she's also um, an HPV cancer advocate, and she's a partner in our campaign. 
And she's, she talks about her first-hand experience and how she wants to bring that into bringing awareness to people. So she's very, she want, so that's really another reason that we kind of, that we can support patients, we can work with people who've survived cancer and we have a kind of duty to do that. So how do we do that? IPVS has set up a campaign. We work globally. We have um, an international awareness program. We're on social media. We do local events um, in our local community, and we work with them to get press events and awareness and other activities going. We've been running for seven years now. Our One Less Worry campaign, which you may have seen in all the brandings over here, has now been, is now in its third year but we've gradually kind of developed our thinking and our engagement around the campaign. One Less Worry really came out at the end of, as we were kind of thinking about coming out of the COVID pandemic and the sense of anxiety, we felt that there was enough anxiety in the world. So what we have with HPV is a, really, is a solution. We can, we can vaccinate, we can screen, we can actually deliver a solution. So we really want to lead with that optimistic message. We have an awareness day on March 4th every year, but we campaign through the year um, to raise awareness and we tie in to, um, mostly to international and global campaigns, but um, our members and partners can use our campaign resources at any point in the year to raise awareness. And I'm aware that in the UK right now, it's Cervical Cancer Screening Awareness Week. So we're gonna be looking at what we can do to reinforce that message here. So one of our principles is that HPV is a, is a global concern, but we need to act, lo act locally to address it. So we want to increase public awareness throughout the world, raise a global level of understanding. We also think stigma is a really um, big barrier to access, not just accessing vaccination and screening, but also to, um, to, to to accessing services. So we really want people to be able to talk about that. Um, and we want to find positive ways to talk about HPV and cancers um, that encourage, that, that remove those barriers and make it easier for um, everybody, but particularly for women who seem to be the ones that suffer the most stigma from HPV, principally because screening can only identify HPV in women. So. And we want people to well, we want to inspire people to take action. So we provide people with the knowledge that they need to make a decision about their health and well-being. And we use human stories to engage people in those. And we use those stories from around the world. So our website has got a number of um, personal testimonies, but we also group a lot of information there around specific facts around HPV, what that is, how it affects you, how you can how you can um, protect protect yourself from HPV related cancers and we group those into particular audiences and promote that information. Um, so that's all there if you go to our website which is askaboutHPV.com. We also produce materials. These are translated into a lot of into a number of international languages. We have a, a global. We, we work with a, in a number of target areas, um, so there's a lot of translated information. I think our website is available now in ten languages, um, so you can find all the information you need. We have social media channels where you can see all this. We have. And from our resources are designed to jump out at you when you go through social media. Um, we don't. We pride ourselves on not looking like your average public health campaign and bringing something new to the table, and um, that seems to be working. We also work really closely with um, online influencers and leverage people that have already got an audience and are talking to women, young people, men about. Um, about health issues, and that helps us to reach a bigger audience. It's always a challenge to get out of your um, uh, your health echo chamber, but we do that very well. And we also run a number of events um, and media around the world. You can see on the far right there, that's, um, the pub that's a public administration building in Sao Paulo that's used our branding to light the whole thing. Um, taking the inspiration from our, and we've taken inspiration for that for our purple light ups in Edinburgh. I think AICC was also purple on March 4th. So, um, and you can see these events happening all over the world. 
and happening right here in Edinburgh. So we are, yeah, on March 4th, uh, I think that I'm there running around Edinburgh with colleagues and accosting people in the street and hanging collars on Greyfriars Bobby to try and raise awareness. And, um, and we've, that, it, it was great on, great on social media, but if you actually go on to Google Maps now, you will find all of these images. <laughs> we've, we've made sure that HPV is, is still there. If you go to Greyfriars Bobby you'll find, on Google Maps, you will still find our HPV messaging hanging around. Um, we're thorough. <laughs> and you can see we, we're really proud of how our campaign has grown and audience. Um, you can see we've reached nearly 200 million people. Um, through our Google and Facebook and Instagram accounts um, in the last year, and that's grown year on year. And our website gets got a million visitors last year. Yeah, so that's our total impressions for the campaign. So what's next? Um, really just building, continuing to, I've just come out of a strategy meeting before I was here. So we've, we're committed to going forward with the same campaign. We're still talking about One Less Worry. Um, we're going to build on what was extremely successful this year, which were the personal stories that were really engaging around the world, and we could target those into particular um, demographics that we, knew, that we knew would be interested in. That was really effective. Um, we're going to work this year as we're starting to branch out and actually look at communication skills of healthcare providers and looking at working in partnership with what some of our um, campaign partners to look at how we do that, in particular in specific regions around the world. So at the moment, we're looking at Middle East and North Africa and East Africa for that. Um, looking at reaching out to underserved communities, which we do through our partners and also through our campaign um, online. And really looking at how we can get a handle on campaign impact. We really want, it's, it's a very difficult thing to measure the impact of a campaign and see who's actually taking action. But we're looking now at doing some very localised campaign work so that we can compare with other communities that are the same so we're, and, and see if the combination of our campaign work and some other um, initiatives around access actually improves take up of the vac of vaccination and screening. So we're hoping to get the magic evidence that our campaign actually does deliver in terms of increasing vaccination and screening uptake. And really just to say, please join us. Um, you can follow us online. Um, we've got our hashtag for the campaign is One Less Worry. Our hashtag through the year is Ask About HPV. That's our more generic one. And um, you can find and visit us online at askabouthpv.org and you'll see what we're providing. virology at the University of Glasgow and human papillomavirus and cancer is my research ex expertise and I'm one of the chairs of tonight's session together with my colleague Kate Cushieri whom you'll meet later and it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers so without further ado I would like to introduce Sharon Handley, Dr Sharon Handley from the University of Aberdeen so Sharon thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm very happy to be here tonight and I'm going to talk about can we eliminate cervical cancer in the 21st century. So um, cervical cancer is both preventable and it's curable if it's detected early and adequately treated. Yet it remains one of the most common cancers globally and it's one of the highest causes of cancer related deaths in women. And most of the women that are affected are young, undereducated women living in the poorest parts of the world. But even in a high-income country like Scotland, um, women living in the most deprived areas are nearly twice as likely to um, be diagnosed with cervical cancer compared to their more affluent counterparts. And many of these women are also mothers of young children, and depending where the mothers live, the children, their survival opportunities or their lifetime chances can be um, truncated by the premature death of their mother. So with this in mind, in, in May 2017, the Director General of the WHO led a global call to action to eliminate cervical cancer as a public health problem. And the global strategy to eliminate cervical cancer propose, proposes a vision of a world where cervical cancer is eliminated as a public health problem, so that is not 
eradicated. It means it becomes a rare cancer, and that's by the end of the 21st century. And so the elimination target is four cases per 100, or less than four cases per 100,000 women. And to achieve this target by the end of this century, then mathematical modeling showed that the following three targets should be met by, need to be met by 2030. And the targets are 90% um, of girls getting vaccinated by the age of 15, 70% of women having two um, lifetime screens at the age of 35 and 45 with a high, highly sensitive test, and 90% of women with a cancer or with a precancer getting treated. And um, if we do um, reach these, um, sorry, it's not coming up. If we do reach these um, goals, it also helps to support some of the um, SDG goals and targets. So my background is public health, and we've got the, the two um, prevention pillars. We've got vaccination, which is primary prevention, and we've got screening. And um, so I'm just going to go through how they, how they differ. Actually, it's quite, I don't have a, a thing here. So we've got the target. Um, who's the target of um, vaccination and screening? So for um, vaccination, the target is to interrupt the viral transmission. So the target is to prevent the infection, which will then prevent the precancer and then prevent the invasive cancer. With screening, you're not really preventing the disease. What you're trying to do is prevent the disease from progressing so that it becomes serious. The effect, the impact, so for screening, the only person getting the benefit is the woman. With vaccination, the person getting the benefit is not only the woman, but those around her. So it could be her partner, it could be those who are unable to get vaccinated, it could be men, for example, boys who are not part of a gender neutral vaccination program, and society, um, the society at large, at large, because you've got herd immunity. The number of interventions, so you can see now with the vaccination, it's a one or a two lifetime intervention. So it's very, it's not resource intensive. One or two public health interventions can prevent so many cancers. With screening, depending on which country you're in, it could be 10 to 50 lifetime screens. That's very um, resource intensive, it, it's expensive, and um, in many countries you don't have the infrastructure to do this because it's unethical to do a screening test if you're unable to continue on the pathway to treat a woman who has screened positive. For follow-up too, you need, as I've just said, the, the whole pathway, you need local diagnostics and treatment for screening. For vaccination, there's almost no um, follow-up needed. In some countries, you'll do a phase four effectiveness study and safety, safety studies, but that's not in all of the countries. The disease spectrum, so for screening, you're only preventing cervical cancer. With the vaccination, you're preventing um, many different um, genital cancers, anal cancer, head and neck cancer. And you're also preventing something called um, recurrent respiratory papillomatomas, papillomatomas, ptosis, sorry, and that's when young children get the warts, the gen not the genital warts, it's like warts, but it's in, it's in their... Um, in their throat, and that, that can actually, in, um, in low-income countries, the child can suffocate because they, they aren't able to, to um, do vaccination, um, perform surgery against it. So the vaccination targets lots of diseases. And then the side effects, so for screening, you could have some obstetrical side effects. So if you have some treatment, then you could be at risk for premature um, birth or sp a spontaneous um, abortion. You could also have anxiety. If you know you've got a virus, it's, it's causing cancer. And at the moment, we don't treat it. If someone's positive, there's no treatment for it. So the woman has to live with this anxiety. The side effects of the vaccine are very short-lived. It could be some anxiety before the vaccine and then some local short-lived pain. And then the risk of occurrence, there, there can be occurrence, yes, with, with screening, but there's almost no risk of occurrence with a vaccine-targeted HPV type. So it's for this um, reason, sorry, that it's vaccination that will drive the elimination strategy, but screening will expedite it, because there are still some women who couldn't get vaccinated and they need to, to be screened to prevent cervical cancer. 
Next, I'd just like to touch on HPV, gender and equity. So 80% of women and men will be infected by HPV at least one time in their life. It's an equal opportunities virus in that respect. We've all got the same chance of getting infected. However, once you get infected, the risk of disease is not the same in men and women. So 90% of HPV-related cancers occur in women. So um, in 2019, there were 620,000 cases in women and 70,000 new cases in men. So it's almost ninefold in women. 90% of these HPV-related cancers in women are due to cervical cancer, and 80% of cervical cancers um, occur in low- and middle-income countries. So the consequences of an infection are not the same for men and for women. So let's look at countries with the national HPV vaccination program. So currently, there's 142 countries. So 73% of WHO registered countries, member states, have vaccination. And that looks really, really good. But then if you look at the global population, if you look at the map, so the countries that don't have vaccination are the countries that are very populous. So like China, India, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, that's where the burden of disease is really high but these countries still don't have vaccination programs. So globally, it's only 33% of the global cohort of girls that have access to HPV vaccination. This is, um, so lots is being done to try and help this. So um, it, from 2023, Nigeria, Bangladesh, and Indonesia introduced vaccination into their screening program. India is starting in 2024, um, and then there's, for other countries um, that hope to start in 2025 or at the end of 2024. But even with these really populous countries introducing the vaccination by 2025, coverage will leap from 33% to 48%, which is very good, but it's not even half the global cohort. So the reasons for the low or no coverage of HPV vaccination, so there's three main reasons. One is the cost. It's an extremely expensive vaccine. Most low and middle income, lower middle income countries, they don't qualify for Gavi support. And Gavi is an organization that provides many different kinds of vaccines at really low cost to low income countries. And these lower middle income countries can't afford to purchase the, the vaccine for themselves. That's why countries like China and India um, and Russia as well, Lots of them, um, in Asia, there were many countries that just couldn't afford to. Eastern Europe is also a good example where they can't afford to buy vaccination. There was a global shortage, so there was um, a supply issue. And the reason the supply issue happened was partly Gavi was introducing it for multiple age cohorts. So there are not just nine-year-olds, but 90, 14-year-olds 90, were being vaccinated but also many high-income countries started to introduce gender-neutral vaccination for boys. And that meant then the, the girls that really needed it, the countries that really needed it, um, couldn't get access to the vaccine. And then the third one is vaccine hesitancy, and that's the reluctance or the refusal to vaccinate despite the, availabil the availability of a vaccine. And that was um, named by the WHO as a top 10 threat to global health in 2019. And I'm just going to look at the first two, cost and supply, in more detail. So um, recently, Gavi has started a new initiative, which the layout of that slide has gone strange on the screen, but Gavi is now going to fund some middle-income countries, some middle-income countries who couldn't afford to buy the vaccine by themselves, but um, they didn't qualify for original Gavi support. So there are some countries on this slide that um, will be getting um, support for vaccination. So the supply and the demand, so it's better than it used to be. So recently the supply has increased, and I'm going to show you a little bit later, there's three new vaccines that have actually come on board. So this, this supply has led to significant reduction in the risk of the global shortage. In the short term, under the base supply scenario, access risks still exist if the target population significantly expands. And in the low supply scenario, shortages could still result. And most of the shortages occur when you're vaccinating boys or you're vaccinating multiple age cohorts or older age women. So, and this was an, a news article that came in the New York Times just um, at the beginning of the year, too. Um, Merck has had some supply issues, and they had 
committed to developing to providing about 30 million doses to Gavi um, dependent country or to African women to Gavi, and they can only do 18.8 at the moment. So, um, because of this supply um, shortage, the WHO um, up optimized its, its recommendations about who should get the vaccine. So the primary target is, has always been girls 9 to 14 years. That's a, originally, it was, a two, it was three doses and went to two doses. Now they're given the option of a one dose from 9 to 20 years. But you should always prioritize immunocompromised women, women living with HIV. They should get two or three doses. The secondary targets are boys and older, older adults, and we should only be introducing the vaccination of boys and older females, and it should be carefully managed until the global supply um, situation is under control. So originally, the WHO did recommend that high-income countries stopped introducing gender-neutral programs, and that was just until the supply got back to normal, and then they were fine with um, countries introducing it. And then they've got, for the secondary targets, so the older women and boys, they've got a prioritization framework. So this is based on impact and efficiency. So they recommend, in the, sh so in the short term, we should be um, having a one-time catch-up for girls 15 to 20, and then women 21 to 25 years. And then in the long term, when the supply comes back to normal, when we've got more supply than demand, then introduce boys or older women. And the considerations when the coverage in girls is low is the first thing is to try really hard to get it up in the girls. And then the next thing you want to do is try and introduce it with boys. But what normally happens if, if you introduce it to boys, so girls and boys tend to stick to their own um, social networks. So if you think of um, African-American women in the US, their uptake is much lower compared to women living, for example, on the East Coast. If you introduce it for boys, it's also going to be the African-American boys that don't get the vaccine, and it'll probably be the white boys on the East Coast that do. So just introducing it for boys often doesn't help vaccination coverage in girls. Because of the one dose recommendation that many countries have switched to one dose, you can see in the different regions, most of the Gavi countries now are doing a one dose. The UK switched to a one dose and they actually went further than 20. They've gone it to the age 25. Um, and they're doing it up until the age of 25 for girls only. Boys don't get it up to the age of 25. And they're recommending two doses for men who have sex with men over the age of 25. And it's, it's, there we go. Is that correct? Yeah. So, the gen, and even when the WHO actually asked high income countries not to introduce um, gender neutral vaccination programs because of the one dose being introduced, that should have really um, freed up some vaccination doses. But then what happened was high income countries then introduced it for boys as well. So we've now got um, over 73% of high income countries, they have the, the gender neutral approach. Low, low and middle income countries, not many do. Bhutan is one of the um, exceptions that do offer vaccination to boys as a lower middle income country. So with the 90% coverage targets, how do the countries perform? Many countries struggle to reach the 90%. So even with high income countries, only 71% have reached this 90% target. I think it's Norway, the Seychelles, Portugal, and Chile are the high income countries that have got over 90%. Um, and then the, low, the lowest income countries, they were strongly affected by COVID, so coverage went down. Higher income countries were not as affected with the coverage. So this is a coverage going down. You can see from um, 2019 to 2020, apart from the European region of the WHO, most of the countries then their coverage went down because of COVID as well. Next, the vaccines. So the good news is we've got some new vaccines. You've got Sikaline, which is a Chinese vaccine. You've got 
um, Walner Vax, which is an Indian vaccine, and they've got Servovax, which is also a Chinese vaccine. These are extremely cheap. The Cicaline is made using E. coli expressing agents, so it's much, much cheaper. The cost at the moment is about $2.90. If you look at Gardasil 9, that's about $100, actually, cost price. The other bivalent and quadrivalent are cheaper. Gavi offers the vaccines at around four or five dollars, but this Chinese vaccine is much cheaper. It's a bivalent vaccine. The Indian one is just under review to be pre-qualified by the WHO, and the, the new Chinese one is to be submitted. And some really exciting information that hasn't really been in the media, it hasn't been announced, but the the Cicaline vaccine. So I think GSK are. Um, going together with that company, Innovax, and they're going to, I think, make a nine-valent vaccine with the GSK adjuvant, but the Innovax expressing agent. So that'll be a much, much cheaper nine-valent vaccine. And I believe the bivalent vaccine from Cervarix is being taken off the market in 2024. So once this really cheap nine-valent vaccine comes on board, that will really help low- and middle-income countries as well. So I'm also just going to quickly touch on Scotland before I finish, because Scotland, as you know, is a high-income country. Um, but despite this, um, we do do well. So we did really well with the vaccination. That was all the coverage about the, the success of the Scottish vaccination programme. And there was no cases of cervical cancer in the routine cohorts we'd been vaccinated at 12 and 13 years. But you have to get vaccinated for the vaccine to work. So if you look at the incidence by country in the UK, Scotland has always historically had higher cervical cancer incidence than the other countries in the UK. Um, there are higher levels of deprivation and 20% of the population live rurally, so sometimes you might have to get a boat to get um, to screening. If you look at cervical cancer incidence by deprivation in Scotland, so despite being a high-income country where vaccination is free, where screening is free, um, those in the most deprived um, quintile have almost double the incidence than those in the least deprived. And that's the same with um, mortality. It's four times higher. So the deprivation gradient is even higher with mortality. And we can see uh, screening coverage, there's always been a 10% difference between the most and the least deprived for screening, but it's been stable over time. Vaccination, however, is not stable over time. So initially, there was 90, around 90% 90 coverage in all the quintiles, but that gap is increasing now. And it's gone from 6.8% in 2016 to 12, it's doubled in 2020. And there's only 90% or high, higher coverage in um, those that are least deprived. And then this is even scarier. So if you look at uptake of screening in fully vaccinated women, it's almost 70%. So you're almost reaching the WHO target. If you look at the uptake of screening in women who are not vaccinated, it's, it's more than half. It's 32%. So these women are not getting vaccinated and they're not being screened. So they're at really high risk of cervical cancer. And then if you look at it by um, NHS um, Health Board, this is the screening coverage of unvaccinated women by Health Board in Scotland. You can see in areas where there's lots of deprivation, so Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and um, here in Lothian, in the 24 to 29 age group, less than 30% of women who aren't vaccinated are getting screened. So elimination in Scotland, I'm just quickly going to go through this. So before, um, when, when are we going to reach the elimination target? Sweden's announced they're going to do it before 2030, Australia before 2035, and England and Ireland around 2040. So with current screening and vaccination uptake, it's going to be 10 years later in Scotland. So elimination for the population as a whole is going to be between 2047 and 2051. The least deprived will not reach it until... No, they'll reach it earlier, 2032, but the most deprived, it will take another 25 years. So it might not be until 2060 when the most deprived can get vax, um, reach the elimination target. So um, wash rates for birth cohorts were never eligible for vaccination where screening still remains the key. Among women vaccinated part, as part of the routine program, cervical cancer rates are below the elimination threshold in all but the most deprived 
deprived quintiles, so screening is the key for those un unvaccinated or suboptimally vaccinated women. So in summary, there's a clear deprivation gradient seen among cervical cancer cases globally and in Scotland. It's driven by lower screening and vaccination coverage in the most deprived. New cheaper HPV vaccines may help increase access to vaccination in low and middle income countries. Scotland will reach the elimination threshold overall at least 10 years later than many high income countries. The most deprived in Scotland will reach it 25 years after the least deprived. Screening, screening is the key for those unvaccinated or suboptimally vaccinated in Scotland. But eliminating self, cervical cancer is a commitment that we must all make, must all make it to girls and women to spare them from the harms of a preventable cancer. And I'm just going to finish with a quote from the late Lynn Denny, who is a really, really strong advocate for women in South Africa, who just passed away last week. In reply to the question about can we eliminate cervical cancer in the 21st century, she said the burden of cervical cancer will not change until a world lends to value the importance of women in our society, to really understand that women's health is critical to our lives on this earth, and until those with power and who control resources allocation chose women as their primary focus. So we've got the tools and we've got the knowledge to prevent cervical cancer, but we need the commitment too from those in power. So thank you very much. So thank you, Sharon. Just to remind you, we're going to have a question and answer session at the end. So if you have burning questions, just hold on to them for now. We'll be able to ask them at the end. So now I would like to invite our second speaker, Professor Heather Kirby from the University of Edinburgh, who is currently fixing her microphone to the stage. Thanks, Heather. I was, excuse me, just taking a minute or two. I don't have any pockets, which is not a sensible thing with the microphone. <laughs> so good, good evening, everyone. Thank you to the organisers for giving me the opportunity to speak today on something a bit different from what you've already heard about HPV vaccination. You've heard the benefits, the huge benefits from Sharon, but you've also heard about poor uptake. Am I allowed to ask for those of you born before 1990 here, uh, after 1990, sorry, have you taken the opportunity of this free vaccine? We've also heard about cervical screening, how important it is. And our UK programme consists of HPV test followed by cytology for the positives and colposcopy examination for those who show cytological abnormalities. An expensive screen, but still available free. Freely available on our NHS. Now, take a few seconds to imagine you are a woman who is bleeding, in pain, ostracised by your family because you smell, living in poverty, so your washing facilities are limited, and no one to turn to because all medical help costs money which you don't have. That's the reality for many women in low-income countries who develop cervical cancer, and which you've just heard can be prevented. Surely you would agree this has to change, and we do have the tools to change it in other countries as well as here. Hence, as Sharon has demonstrated so well, the World Health, Health Organization's goal to eliminate cervical cancer by 2050, the 90-70-90 strategy. This isn't changing, sorry. Specifically, I want to talk about a very beautiful country, Malawi, sometimes called the warm heart of Africa, where the people are friendly, resilient, peace-loving, and mostly desperately poor. When I first went there in 2013, neither HPV vaccine nor cervical screening were accessible to most of the population, and the cervical cancer rate, both in terms of incidence and mortality was the highest in the world. 
Life expectancy there is 64 years. Infant mortality is high. There's a high prevalence of HIV and AIDS. And, sorry, these are, um, that the spend on healthcare in Malawi is $33 per person per year. Compare that with uh, nearly $5,000 per person per year in the UK. What can be affordable under those kind of conditions? So a little bit more about Malawi, because some of you may not have heard of it, although if you're Scottish, I believe you will have. Because Malawi is a landlocked country in sub-Saharan Africa, and it has three regions, north, central, and south, because it's a long, thin country. And Lake Malawi, which I think you can probably see running all the way down here, it's uh, like the year, it's 365 miles long and 52 miles wide. So Malawi is the seventh poorest country in the world. It's largely dependent on agriculture, where 90% of the population are rural, 90%, um, and they're mostly subsistence farmers. An even more relevant statistic is that more than half of the population is under the age of 18. Their official language is English, which is lucky for us, and it's a hugely democratic, multi-party state. That's been witnessed, sadly, by the tragic air crash last week, which killed their vice president and nine other senior uh, uh, um, members of government and, their, uh, and, and, the, and crew. Malawians have stood together as a single country. They're currently in mourning as a one nation, and we're mourning with them. The important thing, though, for Malawi, now it's the second highest incident rate. I said it was the, the highest when we started. But the important one is that if uh, nothing is done, then the number of cervical cancer cases will rise significantly, actually fueled by longer survival of those with HIV and a lack of those preventative measures. So what's the key principle uh, behind a successful engagement, which we have with my partner, uh, Christine Campbell here, um, between Scotland and Malawi? Well, think partnership. Think every letter of the word. You need to plan and implement together appropriately with respect, trust, and mutual understanding. Transparency and accountability for what you do and offer there are important, with no one left behind. No one. It needs to be effective and reciprocal, sustainable, and you must do no harm. There needs to be interconnectivity between all those who are participating and parity. Now, just before Christine and I went to Malawi for that first time, the Scotland-Malawi partnership, to which I belong and am proud to be chair, developed these partnership principles. There are guiding lights for ensuring that mutual trusting relationships can be developed between different countries, whatever their backgrounds and attainments, but who have similar aspirations and concerns for their own population. Partnership requires that several different elements it doesn't actually matter what the partnership is, whether it's marriage, a business arrangement, or global citizenship in action. You need the same elements, an ability to listen to each other, to understand the context and the culture where you're trying to inter interact, to overcome the myths and misconceptions that exist in a population, both about what you intend to do together and the ethos of that partnership. And only then can you inform effectively and educate for the future. So Anita started by talking about awareness. Awareness leads to education. 
and that's true in Malawi just as it is in other countries. So a little bit more about the Scotland-Malawi partnership, because really I'm very proud of it. It's a membership organisation with around 1,300 members, and research from both Glasgow and University, uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh universities in 2018 showed that over 100,000 Scots, maybe some of you are part of this, and over 200,000 Malawians were involved in some way with a link. Furthermore, Malawians, the Scots really appreciate this link. Almost half of the population personally knows someone who has a link. It's quite a unique partnership between two countries. And if you want to know anything more about it, then just come and ask me afterwards or check out the, the website. So back to Malawi. Our first project centered on Nakoma Mission Hospital, a centuries old institution with which several Scottish churches and Edinburgh University had and have active links. So in fact, all the universities in Scotland have some kind of link. Within three years, uh, we, we got three years of funding from the Scottish Government's International Development Fund for Malawi, and we aimed to create a hub and spokes model of cervical screening with same day screen and treat and consistent quality assured screening. So how do you go about it if it's a mutual partnership? We spent the first six months just listening, planning together, including obtaining the essential approval from the local territorial authority, remembering the culture. So here are Christine and I meeting with T.A. Matangera and her senior staff. Uh, she was responsible for the, uh, the traditional area in which Nokomas was set. And without her permission, we couldn't even start. Fortunately for us, she was a woman. She understood the issues, and she was glad to be able to pass on her approval to more local uh, people. Then we had to explain the, the project and gain approval on a cascade of governance, both from the Ministry of Health, so the official government, but also the territorial system through the village headmen and communities, and then to the men and women who were attending both family planning and HIV counselling clinics in Nakoma. It was important for us to have information sessions with healthcare professionals, and actually, that's something in the awareness campaigns that is sometimes forgotten, that the knowledge and understanding of cervical cancer, even within healthcare practitioners, can be low. We then had to develop oral messages to give to women who attended the new screening clinics we wished to set up, because many are illiterate, and paper messages would have been far too expensive to have considered. So, then we had, so this was all what we call sensitization, but actually it's the same as awareness. Then we had to create clinics, often from empty rooms with appalling uh, conditions, filthy, equip them and make sure there was privacy um, uh, and um, dignity for the women who were coming. After that, uh, we wanted to expand from the hospital to the spokes and create clinics there. That was a little more difficult and sometimes they needed actually water and electricity supplied. Uh, they had bare rooms, maybe bare rooms with no windows. And then sometimes there weren't even those kind of rooms available in remote areas. And then we would join up with uh, mobile clinics to go to really remote villages. This is the queue developing for the visit of the monthly visit of a four by four van carrying equipment for under fives assessments. So we joined them. Sometimes, of course, there wasn't room, so we needed a tent. And the equipment we needed sometimes had to run not off electrical power, but off batteries. 
somewhat different environment to carry out your cervical screening. Not using cytology, as was used at that time in the UK, but what is called visual inspection with acetic acid, or VIA, where the cervix is simply swabbed with acetic acid and the abnormalities show up as white. In some uh, settings, VIA had a bad name. It wasn't reproducible or consistent. So we always included a significant period of practice rather than just theoretical learning before providers saw any women. We also needed a different treatment modality, not cryotherapy, which had been used throughout Africa and including Malawi, was only occasionally available and very expensive, unwieldy, and associated with welding. So as you can imagine, not very acceptable to women. Indeed, in early attempts to provide screening, few of those who were VIA positive received treatment. And as Sharon said, it is completely unethical to have screening if you cannot deal with the consequences of the positive cases that emerge. So for us, the importance of training of those who were doing the providing and consistent uh, continuous professional development, or CPD, um, both for the VIA providers, but also for the people who were collecting the data so we could see whether we had actually a good model, a good service that was reproducible. Um, during COVID, the CPD carried on online. Well, what about screening? We didn't carry on screening in the UK during COVID, but they did in Malawi because our Malawian colleagues were insistent that it was too important for their women to stop, and they succeeded in convincing their government that they should continue. That was an amazing outcome and something that we can learn from, that actually advocacy can really work. It's also, of course, important to disseminate your outcomes to important for people, whether in both Malawi and in Scotland, and we had to do that regularly in reporting back to our funders, the Scottish Government. But these images show Beatrice Kabota here, actually meeting with Humza Yusuf when he was in Minister for International Development. And over here, two national symposium, this one in 2016 after our first project, and this is the, the, uh, uh, the First Lady addressing the very large uh, number of Malawians who were present. And this one, which happened just in March this year, which was uh, where the Minister of Health was the important um, speaker. Oh, I don't know why those ones didn't come in. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, our first project ran from 2013 to 2016, and by the end of that funding, more than 17,000 women who had never had access to screening had received it, and over 80% of them, therefore almost reaching WHO target for first-line treatment, even at that time, had received it on the same day. Don't you think Scottish women would love a service which could provide sample taking, results, and treatment of precancers in the same day? But of course, our methods are all very different. Furthermore, the thermal ablation treatment which we had introduced from Dundee had not only been adopted by Malawi, the whole country, but by 2019, WHO itself had endorsed its use and described it as a game changer for Africa. What pride we could all have in this achievement. Scottish expertise in action with Malawian deliverers. Good pro uh, partnership was developing. And it led to further funding from the Scottish Government in a programme called Malscott, which is led by Christine, to expand the hub and spokes model across the th all three regions. Eight hubs, 42 health centres, so 50 clinics. This funding, has just fen uh, f this funding has just ended. Did it work? Is the programme we built together sustainable and expandable to the rest of the population of Malawi? We believe 
the answer is a resounding yes. So some big numbers. Over the period of Malscott, 135,712 women were screened through our sites. And of these, nearly 103,000 were first ever attenders. That is, women who had never had access before. And that equates to 32.7% of the eligible population in our area. Um, what were some of the percentages you gave, Sharon, in Scotland, in different groups, in the lowest deprived, for example? So let's compare what Malscott has achieved with national screening coverage, first of all, in Malawi. Well, it was under 20% in Malawi in 2019. And although over the next four years that has increased significantly, largely due to the efforts of external funders, particularly the United States, to increase the number of women living with HIV who were screened, um, that's increased the percentage coverage. But the picture was not so good for the HIV negative women because they had less access. And that's a problem you can get when uh, particular studies and projects focus in one direction. Malscott sought to reach all eligible women in the rural areas that it was serving, including the vulnerable women with disabilities, albinism, which is high in Malawi, mental health problems, and in prison. All women are equal. And importantly, in our outcomes, the percentage of women who are VIA positive or show suspicion of cancer has dropped since we began in 2013. Anecdotally, the palliative care ward in Nkoma rarely sees a woman with terminal cervical cancer these days. So, a little bit recapping on what Sharon has said, 65% uh, at uh, attendance, that's pretty sh short of the WHO goal of 70%. And yet, a decade or so ago and more, the UK had above 80%. It slipped. Why are Scottish women voting with their feet when Malawian women are so eager to accept a free and preventative service delivered, uh, paid for, for by outsiders? So what can we learn from our Malawian colleagues and I've got three suggestions. One is that oral information can often be better than written uh, information, much of which goes in the bucket without being read. And if we could produce perhaps some video loops while people are waiting in clinics and we hear waiting times, whether it's before or once you get into clinic, that might be a good idea. Treatment on the same day to remove that anxiety, which is what is holding many people back. Hmm, that might be quite a good, day, a good thing too. But is it achievable with the kind of systems we have? Probably not. And the third thing, I can't quite remember. <laughs> Never mind. So I don't know why that picture has come up. Yes, I do, because what about the elephant in the room? I have not yet mentioned HPV. Yet it's the overriding theme of these talks. And I'm an HPV virologist. I've worked with this virus since the late 1960s, long before many of you were born. And we did try HPV uh, testing in our first project in coma. And that's me talking to the, to the lab staff, using the best uh, available, the most suitable, uh, available tests for low-income countries. That's the virus. This is the test, the Cepheid um, expert test. It worked very well, and we had a, a rapid turnaround time um, of less than two hours. But it was so expensive. We would not have been able to have rolled out our second project if we had used HPV testing in it. Our goal was high coverage and understanding first. Eight years on, 
from that first project, the cost of HPV tests is still prohibitive. Furthermore, there are too many tests available, too many that have not been validated, although Kate Kashiri and her colleagues across Europe are doing their best, working valiantly to make sure more tests um, have the standards that they should have. But who should choose what test? Who would pay for a country like Malawi to provide this test? They'll never have the resources with the Ministry of Health, within the Ministry of Health to fund cervical screening. It's not a top priority, despite them having this very high incidence. What about malaria, H, uh, HIV and TB? These actually are all very significant problems too. And that's true in many other low-income countries, dependent on someone else to pay for the tests. Could even the World Health Organization provide tests for these countries in the way Gavi and men has happened or the, food, the World Food Programme? No wonder WHO has had a consultation out just in the last few months uh, to, for new standards in HPV tests for screening. I think the highest priority within that should be cost. What we need is a simple, quick HPV test for use directly in the clinic. One that's cheap, just as tests for malaria, HIV and COVID have become. Doing nothing just because you can't afford the HPV tests that we think are necessary for screening is not an option. WHO has calculated that for every dollar invested in cervical screening prevention, in fact, cervical cancer prevention, $26 is saved in terms of keeping mothers alive, healthy, supporting their families, and remaining economically active in desperately poor, poor countries. So for now, I believe that that high coverage of competency assessed staff and quality assured VIA is more affordable than HPV for a population based cervical screening service, especially where the HPV prevalence is high. We need to start lobbying the manufacturers much more effectively. And the only manufacturer person associated that I know in the audience was Jane when she was with Abbott, um, but there are other companies too. But we need to lobby much more effectively to produce quality assured low cost point of care tests for HPV. So in summary, HPV vaccination is a game changer for future generations of women. But for now, screening is essential. You've heard that. Screening needs to be free for eligible women. And in Malawi, that age range is 25 to 49. But also, there need to be funding sources for the treatment that is required when people are found to have abnormalities. That has to be factored in to end the cost of any program. So we've proved that the use of VIA as a screening test can be, is feasible, can be effective and sustainable until such time as that HPV test is affordable. Now this summary does not uh, simply relate to Malawi, but it's equally true for other low income countries and middle income countries too, many of them. And so we need to continue urgently to look at the community sensitization, awareness, and education. We need to look at engagement and advocacy if we are ever going to meet the WHO elimination targets. And of course, that's exactly what this series of talks is trying to do. So I'd like to finish just by acknowledging our partnership. First of all, the Scottish Government, um, for the funding which allowed this to take part, uh, to take place, and actually a remarkably small investment over nine years, nine of the last 11 years, I think has yielded huge impact. 
The Scottish team members, most of whom came from the NHS, but not all, and from several different health boards, and especially Christine um, as, lead, as my partner in the first project and lead of the second project. And in Malawi, Sister Beatrice Kubota, our national coordinator, has, who has done so much to ensure that uh, things are, are done, and done quickly. We're not doing it. It's the Malawians that are doing it. And the Malawi the Ministry of Health too, especially in the Reproductive uh, Directorate and Safe Motherhood Committee, because we, if we hadn't had their support all the way through, we would not have achieved what has, has been achieved. And finally, thank you all for listening. You can see how big the group was when, at our last meeting in uh, February. Thank you. Um, the University of California at San Francisco, who is going to be joining us via a live link. So hopefully, Joe, you're here. You are here. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Kate. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this uh, very um, interesting and uh, accomplished group of uh, speakers. Um, Special hi to uh, to Sharon and Anita and to Heather, who I've had a very long and very uh, very uh, pleasant relationship for many many years. So um, it's a real pleasure to be with you. Welcome uh, to the view behind me in San Francisco. Of course, I'm not really there. This is my screenshot, but it is the view that I would see from my office. Uh, I'm uh, Joel Polevsky, Professor of Medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. And uh, the topic for today is something a little bit different, which is what about the boys? And what I'd like to talk to you about is the importance and the implications of HPV infection in males. But uh, before I do that again, I'd just like to show you where I am. So I showed you the view from my office and uh, that little red arrow there is where my actual office and lab are. And that's what you would see if you were looking out that window. And behind is Mount Davidson with, um, I think, a lovely view of San Francisco and something that we get very frequently. Those of you who visited San Francisco probably know this, which is our fog. Um, but today it is actually lovely and warm. So in our uh, brief time together, I'd like to talk about boys and men specifically. Um, the focus up to now quite uh, naturally has been on women since cervical cancer in particular is by far the most common cause of morbidity and mortality related to HPV. But for a number of reasons, um, boys and men are very important in the overall scheme of things. And that's for two primary reasons. The first is that HPV can also cause disease in boys and men. So we'll talk about that. And HPV is primarily a, a sexually acquired and transmitted virus. And um, boys and men obviously play a role in that. So uh, we need to talk about HPV itself and we need to talk about how the virus gets spread and therefore who is potentially at risk of the consequences of HPV infection. You've also heard uh, up to this point some really good news about what we can do about this. And just as there are tools to help prevent HPV-related mortality in women, there are similar tools, the same tools, in fact, for boys and men. And there are three primary things that boys and men can do to protect themselves and the people they care about. One is vaccination against HPV. The second is screening. Now you may think that's a little strange since when we talk about screening, by default, we usually mean screening the cervix for precancerous changes to prevent progression to cancer by removing those precancers before that can happen. But I'm going to be telling you about some new screening opportunities 
for men and also to participate in the campaign that you've heard of in a, in a few contexts already. And that means being aware of HPV, the causative agent, the virus, and um, talking about it, having open discussions about it with friends, family, basically anyone will listen. So let's put men and uh, boys and women and girls in context when it comes to HPV. So at the bottom, you can see our uh, numbers of cases. And actually, we don't talk that much about this, but by far the most common HPV-related consequence is genital warts. We don't talk about them so much because genital warts do not cause fatality. They are, however, very important. They're, as you can see, the most frequent uh, abnormality that can occur after HPV infection, but they are not without consequence. While they don't cause cancer or kill people, they're a very significant source of depression, anxiety, psychosocial dysfunction, and also a significant cost to healthcare systems to uh, treat them once they develop. The good news is that the vaccines that we primarily developed to prevent cancers were also designed to prevent acquisition of the HPV types, type 6 and 11, that cause genital warts. So we tend to primarily focus on the benefits of vaccination for cancer, but in fact, there's another very significant benefit, which people I think would value if they understood better. That is that the vaccines can also prevent genital warts. <clears throat> but let's turn to cancers and precancers. So uh, the precancers, I'll show you a picture of what some of these look like in a moment. Also, many millions of them, these are the lesions that can progress to cancer. Fortunately, not all of them do, but we don't have a great way of determining which ones do and which ones don't. So it's standard of practice to treat all of the ones that have the potential to progress. <clears throat> um, but the cases of cancer that you can see here, again, by far in the women, the most common are the cervical cancer cases. But if you take cervical cancer out of the equation and you count up the number of cases at anatomic sites other than cervical cancer in women, these include the vulva and the vagina, the oropharynx and the anus, and compare that to the number of cases of HPV-related cancers in men, uh, they're actually pretty equivalent. Uh, by far in men, the most common cause of HPV-related cancer are oropharyngeal, and you'll notice that these are actually more common in men than in women. We could talk about why that is perhaps in the question and answer period if there's some interest in that. But anal cancer is a very important cause of HPV-related cancer in men. One that is not shown on this slide, which also causes some cancers in men, are penile cancer. But we don't know nearly as much about those as we do about anal and oropharyngeal cancer. The other thing I want to point out about anal cancer is that although we tend to think about men primarily when we think about anal cancer, in fact, in the general population, anal cancer is quite a bit more common in women than it is in men. And it's not that different from vulvar and vaginal cancer, in fact, in terms of number of cases in women. This is uh, depicted in a slightly different way on this pyramid, where in the pyramid, you can see um, that the, the base of the pyramid is the most frequent disease. And again, these are genital warts. They're a little more common in men than in women. But again, you can see between the two, we have over 30 million cases. And then as you go higher in the pyramid, the case count gets a little lower and lower. And at the top here, you can see there is penile cancer, which is not insubstantial. But as you heard, HPV-related cancers are diagnosed to more than 600,000 men and women every year around the world. And uh, it, it takes the lives not only of at least half of them, but also tends to take the lives of young, very productive people still in the prime of their lives. <clears throat> now, I want to talk about HPV. I'm actually the, uh, the founder and the chairman of the campaign that Anita so nicely presented 
uh, at the beginning of this session, the International HPV Awareness Day campaign. And the reason that I started this on behalf of the International Papillomavirus Society is because I felt that we were not giving enough information on the virus itself. There was a focus on specific diseases, but there was a broad lack of understanding about the cause of it all. And Anita very eloquently explained the benefits of helping people understand about HPV itself. As you've heard, uh, HPV is very, very common. All of us get it, in fact. Not all of us get genital HPV. Some people get it on the feet, on the hands, but a very high proportion do get genital HPV infection because it's quite easy to spread during uh, any form of skin-to-skin -skin contact in the course of sexual relations. We believe that at some point in time, 80 to 85% of all sexually active adults uh, will have a genital HPV. The good news is that HPV only lives in skin cells. That makes it easy to protect against from a vaccination point of view, and is one of the reasons why HPV vaccination is so successful. But again, <clears throat> the spread because of that is really from skin to skin. And so if you think about it, uh, in the course of the range of sexual activities that people may engage in, there are many different opportunities for the virus to get from one anatomic site to another anatomic site. So, um, of course, the virus can be spread between males and females. It can be spread between males and males. It can be spread between females and females. It can be spread to and from transgender people. When I was starting out in the HPV business, um, when we talked about men, there was a, a term that used to be attached to them in this context that I found quite annoying and silly, and that was that men were considered the vector of HPV transmission. And of course, that's silly because, yes, men can spread HPV to their partners, but they also can receive it from partners. And unfortunately, HPV is an equal opportunity transmitter and acquirer. So men are just part of the equation, as are women. So the message that we've been giving uh, through this campaign is that HPV affects us all. And I really mean that uh, not only because a high proportion of us get HPV, not all, but a high proportion do, but even if you haven't, you know someone who's had HPV. That is for sure. So someone you know, care about, love, has the potential to have consequences of HPV infection. So in that regard, <clears throat> HPV is one of the things that unites us all as humanity on this planet. So the, the theme here for um, this session and for the upcoming conference in Edinburgh, which I think promises to be a fantastic event, is that this really is a good news story because we have the tools to actually eliminate HPV-related cancer. You've heard about some of the challenges that are you know, there that prevent us from doing that right now, but in the long term, we will do it. We'd like to get there sooner rather than later. But on the list of things that we can do to eliminate these cancers, are primary and secondary prevention. You've heard about these in different ways. Just to give you the terminology, when we talk about primary prevention, what we really mean is preventing the acquisition of the agent that causes the disease, in this case, HPV. And the primary prevention measure is HPV vaccination. The primary use of the vaccine is to prevent initial acquisition of HPV. So the best way to achieve the maximum benefit from it is to get it before you initiate sexual activity. There is benefit even after initiating sexual activity, but the more sexual partners someone has had, the more opportunity there is for someone to have acquired some HPVs as a result of that, and the less benefit they might get from the vaccine. But since there are nine types in the currently available va vaccine, the thought is that even if you've initiated sexual activity or have evidence of, of precancer, that there's still benefit to be had to protect you against the other HPV types that you may not have yet encountered. So the, as you've heard from Sharon and Heather, in the long term, HPV vaccination is going to be the main answer and solution 
to eliminating HPV related cancers in the long term, but it's going to take a while to get there. And so in the interim, secondary prevention is also key. That's screening, but it's not just the screening. The screening is really the first step. The whole point here is to have another way to prevent cancers in people who may not have benefited from HPV vaccination, either because they were too old, meaning they were already sexually active before the vaccine became available, or they may be of vaccine age, but not have access to the vaccine for some of the reasons that you've already heard about. So here the idea is, okay, we say someone may have already acquired HPV. If they have developed a precancer, let's do what we can to find that precancer and remove it before it has time to progress to cancer. So that's another way of preventing cancer in uh, people who have not been vaccinated. So on this diagram, you can see on the very left side, there's what a, a pictorial of what a normal skin surface looks like. And then on the very far right, I'm sure you'll appreciate there's quite a difference in the appearance of these uh, orange things, which are cells. They have on the right, some of the changes caused by HPV. And if we were to look at them under a microscope, they would show changes that indicate that there are um, some abnormalities that could over time lead to this down here, which are these cells that are dropping through the basement here, the floor, in the form of cancer. So this can sometimes take decades, <clears throat> uh, or it may be faster, particularly in the setting of immune suppression. But by and large, we have ample opportunity if women are coming in at normal screening ages to detect these precancerous changes before this cancer can occur. And the, 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 there are several ways of doing that that you've heard about. One of the most common is the pap smear for the cervix, uh, where the clinician is scraping the cells off the surface, looking at them under a slide. And you can appreciate now that if cells look like this on a slide, they're rather different from cells that uh, would come from a person who doesn't have these changes, who is normal. And then that would prompt the clinician to refer their uh, patient to the next step in the evaluation, which is called colposcopy, where the surface of the cervix is visualized directly through the scope with magnification and special stains. And if they see something that looks like it might be a precancer in the settings where they're not doing VIA, meaning immediate treatment, in high income settings, the more standard practice is to do a biopsy, take a tissue sample about the size of a sesame seed or so to look for changes consistent with what's drawn here. And if there is precancer, then the woman typically comes back and gets a procedure to remove those changes. Nowadays, the most common procedure is called loop electro excision procedure, which basically uses an electric current to slice the abnormal tissue away. And in most cases, not all cases, but in most cases, that does prevent progression to cancer. So that's secondary prevention. Now you may ask yourself, why am I telling you this in the context of a talk about boys? You may have noticed on this slide that we have cervix here, meaning cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, but we also have anal intraepithelial neoplasia here. I'm gonna back, come back to this uh, slide in a little bit, but the reason I'm doing this is because anal cancer is very much like cervical cancer and is preceded by the same sorts of changes. So we and others thought a long time ago, if this works so well to prevent cervical cancer, maybe it could also prevent anal cancer. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. So first, with respect to primary prevention, HPV vaccination of boys, there have been a lot of great studies done at this point. And the great news is that the vaccine works in boys to prevent penile infection, scrotal infection, and anal HPV infection. It prevents genital warts, and it prevents AIN, the anal precancer, in boys just as effectively as it does in young girls and women. This was one of the first um, studies that was published showing that it worked well to prevent genital warts. And then we published another paper a few years later showing that the vaccine 
prevented anal intraepithelial neoplasia, meaning that it had the potential to prevent anal cancer. And interestingly, it was this paper and this study showing that, that the vaccine could prevent cancers in boys that actually led the US FDA to approve HPV vaccination for boys. Uh, in addition, um, even though the study had not been done in women, because anal cancer in women is so similar to anal cancer in men, the FDA added prevention of anal cancer to the list of pre-existing indications for vaccination in women, primarily prevention of genital warts, prevention of cervical cancer, and prevention of vulvar and vaginal cancer. Now, uh, I've also told you that oropharyngeal cancer is a very important cancer in men and women, more so in men. And we don't have data yet directly proving that the vaccine will prevent oropharyngeal cancer, but we have every reason to believe it will. Um, and part of the information that leads us to have this confidence is a study like this from the United States, where they randomly sample women and men from the general population. And they were able to see how common the HPV infections were in the mouth, the kind that could lead to oropharyngeal cancer before and after vaccination was introduced. And you can see that after vaccination, there was a very substantial reduction in the detection of oral HPV in vaccinated individuals. <clears throat> so we think that if you don't get oral HPV infection, you won't get oral cancer. And we do think that it, over the coming years, perhaps decades, we will actually show that in vaccinated individuals that the incidence of oropharyngeal cancer uh, will be declining. So in summary of primary vaccination of boys, it's very safe, just as it is in, in girls and women. It prevents genital warts. Again, I am talk about this a lot because it is a very, very important benefit that people don't fully understand. It will likely, even though it is not yet proven, prevent both anal cancer and oropharyngeal cancer. And the other thing that people ask is, since we're recommending vaccination prior to initiation of sexual activity, the target age range is nine to 12 years old. Uh, are we going to have to give it again? Because people, of course, are still having sex well after uh, their 20s and 30s. And do we need to give another injection of the vaccine to ensure protection? And the answer is we don't really know yet. But the good news is that for as long as we've been following people who've been vaccinated, it seems that that vaccination protection is still there. And so at this point, we've been following people for 10, 11, 12 years after vaccination, then they still seem to be protected. Does that mean they will only need one injection their entire life? We don't know. It's conceivable that they'll need a booster at some point, but we're not at a point yet where we are ready to say that people uh, still need boosters. So that injection so early in life really has potentially uh, lifelong benefits. Now I wanna talk about another benefit that you heard a little bit about from uh, Sharon. Um, this is a slide that suggests that vaccinating males, in addition to protecting the men, may also benefit their partners, whether they be males, females, or transgender persons. And um, this slide actually shows some data in the opposite direction. Um, some of the earliest studies of the benefits of the vaccine against genital warts were done in women because, of course, the vaccine programs were adopted for women long before they were approved for men. These were studies largely done in Australia. And what they showed was that um, the percentage of people who were showing up in sexually transmitted disease clinics with genital warts, women, for example, less than 21, many of whom were vaccinated, when vaccination was introduced, the proportion of women with genital warts came down very substantially. I think we were hoping for that and expecting that, and that's what happened. But what was a great surprise and a very pleasant surprise was that even though the men were not vaccinated, the group of men who were likely their primary sexual partners, the prevalence of HPV came down in them too. So they benefited from female vaccination through a process called herd immunity. The idea being that if 
a woman is protected against HPV if she has sex with an unvaccinated uh, man, then he's going to benefit because she's not going to have HPV to spread to him. The other interesting thing here was that in MSM, men who have sex with men, you did not see that benefit. It stayed pretty stable. And that's also not a surprise because that herd immunity benefit would only come if they were having sex with women. But instead, they were presumably primarily having sex with other unvaccinated men. So it was actually the lack of protection against MSM that was one of the early driving forces for the introduction of gender neutral vaccination, understanding that although men who primarily or exclusively had sex with women would benefit from female vaccination, not all men would, including uh, men who have sex with men. So we think that this herd immunity goes in the other direction too. It hasn't really been proven and it probably never will be because we don't have any programs anywhere in the world where we only vaccinate the men and not the women. So we'll never be able to show the converse, but everything that we know about the biology here suggests that herd immunity goes both ways and that when we vaccinate boys, we protect their female sexual partners too. So based on all of these things, there have been some evolutions in the vaccine programs for, for boys. In the UK, there is, as you heard, a recommendation for a one-dose schedule for um, uh, routine adolescent programs and gay and bisexual men who have sex with men less than 25 years of age. Uh, there is also the possibility of catch-up for individuals uh, who are older than that. And that includes uh, people up to age 45, potentially where their immune systems aren't quite as robust as younger people. So we recommend instead of one dose, a two dose schedule. And then as you heard uh, from Sharon and Heather, immunocompromised people, particularly people with HIV, uh, are very high risk for HPV related disease. And to make sure that their immune systems don't prevent them from mounting a good response to the vaccine, we give even more injections, three doses, instead of the two or the one for the other populations. It's not just for people living with HIV, it's also for people who are immunocompromised for other reasons, including, for instance, if you've had a kidney transplant and are being given medicine by your doctor to prevent rejection of your new graft. So in summary, the benefits of what we call a gender neutral vaccine program, which by definition means both males and females, is that it will de definitely help provide direct protection of males <clears throat> against some HPV related diseases and cancers. There is the issue of gender and health equity, which has been referred to. <clears throat> we think that the burden should be shared for protecting everybody and that involving everybody overcomes stigma. And we also think that this should improve vaccine acceptance amongst parents, which has historically been one of the big barriers to getting uptake of the vaccine. And another benefit not listed on this slide, again, is the potential for herd immunity to protect uh, sexual partners of the boys and men. So I wanna to turn to secondary prevention. And here we're primarily again talking about anal cancer and oropharyngeal cancer. And I wanna talk first about anal cancer. So remember I said I was gonna come back to this slide. We're talking now about AIN2 and 3, which are the anal precancers. And here again, the idea is to try and do what we're doing in the cervix, but apply it to the anus. So what could that actually look like? Well, uh, to do this, we start by doing an exam by putting your finger into the anal rectal area to feel for masses that could potentially indicate the presence of an already existing cancer. If you feel an abnormality, for instance, that's very hard, that's uh, concerning and should prompt referral for that person for a more thorough examination uh, using uh, anoscopy. But um, assuming that that exam does not show that, we can do a swab basically by just inserting a swab into the anus for cytology uh, and HPV, just like in the cervix. And if those are abnormal, then we refer the person to this technique called high resolution anoscopy or HRA, which is very similar to the technique used in the cervix, uh, colposcopy. We biopsy the area and then we treat the precancer, usually using electric current in the office. It's a very short and well 
uh, accepted and tolerated procedure. The problem is, and the reason that we haven't done this so far, is we didn't have evidence that it actually worked to reduce the risk of anal cancer, but now we have those data. Uh, in 2022, we published a paper showing that doing exactly what I just told you does reduce the risk of anal cancer, just like doing cervical screening reduces the risk of cervical cancer. And based on this new information, the Centers for Disease Control and the International Anal Neoplasia Society are now recommending screening for people at risk for anal cancer. CDC focuses on people with HIV. The International Anal Neoplasia Society does also focus on people with HIV, but includes a few other high-risk groups, namely people with immune suppression, not related to HIV, particularly transplant patients, men who have sex with men who are not living with HIV, and women who've had HPV-related cancers or precancers uh, in other anatomic sites like the vulva, the vagina, or the cervix. What about secondary prevention of oropharyngeal cancer? Unfortunately, we don't have any good tests for that yet. It's complicated, it may or may not happen, but there are some tests on the horizon that may have some promise. But for now, the best recommendation is to ask for a very thorough oral examination when you're getting a routine dental checkup, make sure the dentist uh, is looking at the back of the throat, under the tongue, and also feeling the neck carefully for any lymph nodes that may indicate the presence of a cancer. So with that, I want to show you one of those personal testimonials that Anita referred to in her presentation from our HPV awareness campaign. Uh, this is Jason's story. Hi, my name is Jason Mendelson, and I'm a survivor of HPV-related tonsil cancer. <laughs> Here's my story. At the age of 44, I had a small bump that appeared on my neck out of nowhere. And weeks later, ended up having a radical tonsillectomy, neck dissection, 42 lymph nodes removed from my neck, followed by seven weeks of chemo, radiation, and a feeding tube. I had never known anyone diagnosed with this cancer diagnosis and really had never heard of it. I knew HPV had something to do with cervical cancer but certainly not tongue, throat, and tonsil cancer. I was so nervous and worried that I made videos to our three kids saying goodbye, decided to go public with my cancer story to save the lives of boys and girls for generations to come, talking about the HPV vaccine that could protect them from preventable cancers. HPV affects all of us. Together, we can beat it. If this happens, please go to your nose and throat doctor and get Thanking you for allowing me to participate in this meeting and to again end on a very positive note, which is we have the tools and we do hope that you'll join us in the HPV awareness campaign. And our website is www.askabouthpv.org. Thank you so much. Hello, hello, am I on? Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Kate Kashira. I'm director of the HPV Reference Lab that way at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. That was wonderful, Joel. Um, hopefully, you're going to be able to stay with us for Q&A, which is my pleasure to, to moderate just now. So I know we're, we're slightly overrun for time, but I think we've got time for a few questions. And perhaps the speakers, Heather, are you able to join us on stage as well? And we can have a chat. So while, while the speakers are making themselves comfortable, um, does anybody have any question that they would like to ask of them? Don't, don't be shy. I can attest to the fact that not only are they brilliant, they're lovely people as well. So, so no question is a silly one. Okay, yeah, hi. Sorry, I can't, I can't see who you are, but yes, please, yes. by all means. Um, so it's a question. Um, as the presentation's ongoing, I noticed these in the vaccines, there's bivalent and quadrivalent. I'm sorry, I don't have my phone to Google. So if you could just help me understand what, what's the difference between the bivalent and the quadrivalent ones. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Sharon, do you want to? Yeah. So the bivalent vaccine protects against two types of HPV, HPV 16 and 18, which are the most oncogenic types. The quadrivalent vaccine protects against four types, 
16 and 18, and then the two types that cause genital warts, so 6 and 11. And then there's a nine-valent vaccine as well that protects against seven high-risk types, including 16 and 18, and then the genital warts, 6 and 11. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, vaccines have evolved a lot. As Sharon alluded to, since 2008 in the UK, we've had three different ones. So we may have more round the corner, and indeed you alluded to that. Um, other questions? Yes, Joanne. It's about the vaccination programme. How does that work with the catch-up cohort? Do you invite them, or is, it, is the ownership on the individual knowing that they've they've not been vaccinated when they were younger. So is it like a screening programme as such? They are sent reminders or prompts or anything like that. So, um, you're talking about catch-up cohort in girls, Joanne, is yeah, that right? Yeah, in, girls. in Scotland, yeah. So it was, it was three years in Scotland, I think, and two years in England. But Sharon, that's right, isn't it? It was, there was a kind of mix of ways to engage girls, was there not? There was, but now it's yeah. up, are you asking now up to the age of 25? Yeah, so it's up to the age of 25. What I believe, it, it, I don't think they're routinely called. I just, and I don't even know if they, many of them know that they can get it up to the age of 25, because it doesn't take place in a GP surgery, so I don't think the GP would be actively informing them of it. So yeah, you're Correct, they can get it up to the age of 25. Most of them, or many of them, will have been vaccinated. But no, I don't think they're proactively called to get it. I don't know, is anyone here from Public Health Scotland that can enlighten? Okay, it's a good point. Thank you, Joanne. Other questions? Perhaps I can exert my chair's privilege and ask a question of Heather, if that's okay. My former boss, I have to say. Um, uh, wonderful that you're, you're here, Heather. Um, you were saying in Malawi, 90% of the population are rural. I know you were quite reticent about HPV tests too expensive, but if you had a cheap, robust HPV test, what do you think the advantages of perhaps self-sampling might be with such a cheap test in that particular population, given it's so rural? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think that provided it's a point of care test, and does not, as a consequence of the self-sampling, then need to be sent to a lab that's remote, difficult to access over difficult roads. So it needs to be point of care as well. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. But I do have to also say, and I, I, it worries me slightly, that one of the other advantages of VIA is it's the only opportunity a woman has to have a gynae examination. Yeah. Yeah where you might find other things, other sexually transmitted infections, other gynae problems, uh, which would never be diagnosed early enough. And if we ditch that for the cheap point of care HPV test, we'd lose that. Yeah, and that's not a trivial issue at all. Um, I quite agree. Other questions? Yes, please, Ramya, hello. 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 Hi. Um, Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure listening to all of you. My, my two former bosses and Sharon, who I've worked with, and Sheila, who's taught me when I was doing my master's. So it's, it's, I've worked in HPV for, for years, but uh, speaking from Kaijin, uh, where I worked, so Heather, another person from a manufacturer, I think um, what really shocked me from Sharon's presentation is how, how low our screening uptake has, has gone down. What, what can we do in Scotland? What, or what, what are we doing? I was disappointed to see um, a big cancer charity sh shutting down um, recently. So how can we support? What can we do um, to, to beef up those numbers now? Uh, and what's, what's already happening in Scotland that we can, we can support? Who would like to take that? I, don't, I, mean, I know there are people in the audience that are involved in screening, but I think it's unfair to put them in the spot. I, mean, I don't think the UK is the only high-income country that's challenged with falling screening rates. I think, it's, I think it is a, a, a problem generally. Um, is it apathy? Is it reticence? I'm, 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 not, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, there are some things that could be explored, you know, tailored messaging to the most deprived categories. I think that's what Sharon showed very nicely in that data there, that it is the most deprived people who are not coming to screening by and large. 
or not by and large, but you know, statistically more likely to not engage. Uh, Self-sampling may be a route to engage people. Again, some people are very um, off-put perhaps by the speculum and the intimacy of the examination. So DIY, HPV testing, HPV lends itself to, to self-sampling, that might happen. But you'll, you'll perhaps know, Ramy, that some countries have gone live with self-sampling. So in, in Holland, they've done it, and uh, in Sweden and other places, I'm looking for help here, but Australia. they have Australia, um, they, they've done it. Um, I think Scotland are very interested in this. Um, uh, when and if it will be implemented, I'm not quite sure, but I think I think these uh, self-sampling has been taken, taken very seriously. But yes, it it was, it, was, it was really disappointing to hear about Joe's trust collapsing and, and so shocking and they'd like to, maybe it's an opportunity now to say thanks for all the work that, that they did um, supporting individuals and indeed the programme so I think that's a, a good point well made. Could I, could I add something? Yes please Heather, yeah. You know, there, I think we'd have to look at the history too. If you take vaccination, look at measles vaccination, uptake drop, 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 dropped. One of the reasons it dropped was that most people didn't ever see a case of measles. So here we have reached a situation with vaccination. The uptake may not be high enough, but most people, in contrast to what uh, Joel said, and in contrast to my generation, my mother's generation um, of people who, who knew, always knew somebody who had had cervical cancer, um, that perhaps that's diminishing because of all the work that has been done and therefore it's a harder task for the awareness um, and advocacy that needs to be carried out because we have a population where the instance has already gone down. Yeah. Well, I, I, think, um, I think that's a really good point. As much as we don't want more people getting cervical cancer, it's that immediacy and visibility that has, has changed. Um, so I think, I think it is, we, we are slightly over on, but thank you very much to all for the questions. I think there is going to be a reception. Gail's going to uh, close off with some final notices, so thank you. Final word from me. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for, to all our speakers and chairs today. Um, it's been extremely interesting to find out all about the challenges um, and the opportunity combat combating HPV worldwide. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are, have been recording this evening, so if you want to watch it back or share your experience with friends, family, colleagues, then you can see that on the ICC's YouTube channel. Um, also, if you want to stay tuned for future EICC live events, please keep an eye on our What's On page, um, and you can subscribe to our newsletter there also, and also our social media. Um, but first of all, fi finally, I want to say thank you very much for you all coming out tonight. Um, EICC Live will be back in a few months' time with something completely different, so please stay tuned for that. But um, yes, there's drinks outside in the foyer, so we can have a chat then. Oh, yeah. Oh, to Joel. Yes. <laughs> Joel, can you hear us? Thank yes, you very I can. Much. Yes, indeed. Pleasure. Yes. Enjoy your drinks. Okay. Thank you, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> I was so nervous and worried. Hi, my name is Jason Mendelson, and I'm a survivor of HPV-related tonsil cancer. My name is Mary, and I am an anal cancer survivor. Comenzaron todos los estudios y se dieron cuenta que era un tumor en cervical. Tuve una histerectomía total. I had a small bump that appeared on my neck out of nowhere, and weeks later ended up having a radical tonsillectomy neck dissection, 42 lymph nodes removed from my neck. In 2020, I was doing the and it a alteration. So I walked in to see a colorectal surgeon, and he examined me and said, this is an hemorrhoids, you've got anal cancer. 
y yo solo pensaba en, en mis hijos, en Daniel, en Stephanie, en mi mamá, en mis hermanos. Ay, fue la cama de tu papá, de mi familia, de mis hijos, de mi marido, de mis personas de salud. Y yo decidí ir público con mi historia de cáncer para salvar las vidas de niños y niñas por generaciones que vengan. Y me dijeron que no había un gusto, que no había una furia, que no había un gusto. Y yo me empecé a hacer una charidad para apoyar y educar para la comunidad de cáncer anal en Nueva Zelanda. El HPV afecta a todos. Let's tackle it together for one less worry. Por esses meses, fazer essas ações preventivas que é muito importante. Através dele que me curei. Uma vez eu capata matibabu, eu capona cabeça. HPV affects all of us. Together we can beat it.